Good evening. Welcome to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. Tonight, I'm pleased to bring to you a topic that has been dominating headlines, not just over around the world, but right here in Ottawa. Who among us has not been distressed and troubled by the recent suicide deaths of Robin Williams, Anthony Bourdain, and Kate Spade? Closer to home, Canadian MPs have been stressing the urgency to talk about suicide prevention and bring those discussions to you right here on Parliament Hill. Over the years, we have begun to see a transformation in the way we talk about mental health. And we have watched as depression and anxiety have gone from unspeakable topics to mainstream hashtags. And while bringing the conversation into the mainstream is a positive thing, we do need to dig deeper. One in five Canadians will experience personally some sort of mental health issue in any given year. So what happens when you gather the courage to ask for help, but you're not getting it? What are some of your options? What are some healthy coping mechanisms? What happens when we see the legalization of marijuana, and how will it change the Canadian landscape? On tonight's show, we'll be discussing the answers to these questions and much, much more, courtesy of three very special guests. First, I'd like to introduce to you Margaret Meyer. She's an addiction, mental health, and toxicity expert and the president of Naturally You. Margaret overcame alcoholism, abuse, anxiety, obsessive compulsive disorder, PTSD, cancer, and most recently the suicide death of her only son, all without medications, all using holistic therapies. She will be sharing some of her experiences with us, as well as the tools she uses with her clients, including hair and mineral testing, detoxification, and emotional freedom techniques. Welcome to the show, Margaret. Thank you. Next, we're joined by Peter Kunst, the executive director and co-founder of Newgate 180. Located in Merrickville, it is an alcohol and drug addiction treatment center that has helped more than 4,000 people from all walks of life. Thank you for joining us, Peter. Thank you. Later on in the show, we will be joined by Olga Salgado Lacroix. She's a registered social worker who integrates mindfulness, meditation, and yoga into traditional counseling therapy. So make sure you stick around for that. And don't forget to call the number on your screen, 613-728-1001, 613-728-1001. If you have any questions that you'd like to ask our guests, they are waiting for your call. I'd like to start the show by asking uh, your story and how you came to where you are today. Peter, what led you to this line of work? Um, I struggled with my own addiction and um, when I went for help, I went to a treatment center that had a variety of individuals, people out of, uh, I was a working individual and um, the center that I went to had people from the street, people from corrections, um, which uh, was a little bit of a struggle for you didn't me feel to like you belonged? Didn't connect with them um, in many different areas except for the addiction. And so after um, completing the, the treatment uh, and gaining some sobriety, I, I decided to make a change and, and went back to school and, and wanted to make a difference in, in helping people as I had been helped, right? And so I was pretty passionate about it and we wanted to, to, to treat back then people were treatment centers weren't always the um, most um, respectful environments for people to addicts weren't treated very well and, and I really didn't just want to make a change in people's life I wanted to make a change in the system and I imagine having that background helps you be a better counselor um, Yes, it has, and, and one of the things is that people with addiction automatically connect with somebody else with an addiction, they feel they understand. Uh, back in the day, most people that worked in addiction had an addiction themselves. Today, it's very, very different, and, and I often talk to the staff about, so a young woman with a master's degree has to work a lot harder to connect with a blue-collar worker struggling with an addiction than I do. I, I automatically had an in, and I also understand what they've been through. Yeah, yeah. What about you, Margaret? In terms of my story? Yeah. Where do I start? Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I uh, grew up in a very abusive, uh, dysfunctional alcoholic home. So uh, the only common thing was the predictability of unpredictability, which created a lot of anxiety and stress, created a lot of these different mental illness symptoms. Back then, we didn't talk about mental health. I became an alcoholic probably in my 20s. Again, just self-medicating and isolating. and. Uh, 
So it took me a long time. I was one of those real tough alcoholic types who didn't think I had a problem. I got sober once for four years, but went back out. Then I got sober again, another four years, and again went back out. And then finally I realized that I would have to do more to actually stay in the program and deal with my abuse and deal with all the background and the trauma that I was afraid to deal with. And what prompted you to get sober? Uh, I just realized that uh, I was going to die if I didn't change my life and I was miserable, I was negative and I literally would come home and say I hate my life. I knew that I had to make a difference and I had to change and I just knew that that night, the last time I drank, that this was it and I was going to do the work and everything necessary. So for me it wasn't just you know, going into a program. That's where I became familiar with some of the tools that I'm now offering because people who have been traumatized or have a lot of anxiety or stress, they get re-triggered, right? So it's not enough to just quit drinking because then when they quit drinking, all the feelings, all the emotions, all the trauma come back out. So for example, one of the tools I use is emotional freedom techniques. So I started you know, using it on myself. I've now become certified. I've been doing it for 10 years and it really made a huge difference. And now I've been sober you know, over seven years and I have no issues with wanting to drink. And you mentioned earlier, I lost my son to suicide last year and I did not have a drink during that time period and not one medication. Wow. Well, I want to get back into some of those techniques a little bit later on in the show, but Peter, I wanted to ask you in your experience, do addicts typically have to hit rock bottom before they are finally able to accept help? That, that's a big debate, and we don't believe so. Our, what's the ultimate bottom, right? What's rock bottom? I think each individual's rock bottom is quite different, right? Death is the ultimate bottom. Right, and people don't have to die from their addiction, right? So there's many um, different incidences in an addict's life where they hit some kind of crisis that creates some motivation where they look at kind of doing something. And any of those incidences are opportunities to, to, um, for them to ask for help or for somebody around them to kind of create an environment where they're offered some help. Um, and um, traditionally, and I'm talking about, I've been around for a long time, and, and uh, addiction used to deal with people who say, I'm an addict and I need help, and that was the starting point for a lot of treatment centers. It's changed today, right? So when people start looking at their lives and are unsatisfied with the way it's going, um, we can begin to work with people with motivational therapy and a bunch of different techniques that can help them kind of move through the stages of change and then engage in a process. But it's, recovery is a process, not an event. Mm -hmm. And really today we deal with people more at where they're at, which is not, back then it was people had to be at a certain place before we could help them. You, yeah. It's a lifelong journey. Yes. Yeah. We have a caller on the line. Rodney, are you with us? I am. Hi, Rodney. Thank you so much for calling in. Did you have a question for our guests? I do. I used to be uh, an orderly at a psychiatric hospital, and I noticed quite often when an emergency situation would happen, somebody was experimenting with drugs, and it kicked their psychiatric issue into overdrive. And I'm just wondering, like, with the legalization of pot, is that going to be more prevalent, and is the government going to take, you know, measures to help these individuals who are now doing it legally. Margaret, you have a personal issue with this. So what was really his question? Uh, well, what's the role, I, I guess, Rodney, if we understood correctly, the, the role of marijuana in kicking people's um, psychosis into overdrive or triggering a condition? Sorry. Yes. That's a really great question. So uh, with regards to my son, Adam, um, 24 years old, he had been struggling with OCD and anxiety for much of his life. That's him on the screen right there as a child. Yeah, that's my boy. Yeah. And uh, so he uh, ended up one night, uh, you know, he was on medications and we had actually had to talk about marijuana not to earlier before that and I said to him I don't know a lot about marijuana but I don't think you should smoke it oh no mom it's safe they're going to be legalizing it etc so he ended up going out with a bunch of frat friends 10 people uh, he, somebody kept bothering him about trying it he eventually smoked it out of a bong and he came back a totally different person and he ended up developing 
depersonalization disorder. Uh, he was diagnosed at the Queensway Carlton with psychosis, really brain damaged trauma. And he, the really sad thing was he ended up developing burning sulfuric acid pain somatoform disorder, which, uh, you know, even after 19 different medications, they couldn't get a handle on it. So in the end, he was begging for uh, MAID, medically assisted dying, and he went public about it. And uh, it caused, you know, a big debate in the country because we're currently debating the laws. Uh, but the sad thing is he ended up having to methodically go after a drug that would actually kill him peacefully. He wanted to die a peaceful death. And in the end, he died in a motel room alone without me or his father uh, because we would have been charged for legally abetting a suicide. So when we went to the Queensway Carlton Hospital, I had been informed, quote, we're seeing more and more young people, especially 25 and under with the developing brain, uh, being diagnosed with psychosis and schizophrenia, first time users. So in AA, I go. I still go to my AA program. I started bringing this up, and a lot of other parents started saying, "You know, my daughter or my son started smoking it, and it just jacked up their anxiety or their OCD." So, from what I've learned and the research I've done in the last number of months, anybody 25 and under shouldn't be smoking it because of the developing brain. And if you have mental illness, you should definitely stay away from it. And Peter, what are your thoughts? The, I, I just want to reinforce that the Medical Association of Canada, the Pediatric Association of Canada just came out with their recommendations and basically the, the guideline is 25. Once the brain is developed, it's less damaging. Um, we don't, th there isn't kind of um, enough information, th there is enough information um, in pieces uh, about the effects of marijuana and the negative effects of marijuana um, uh, that really make it uh, very concerning. I do think that it does. Psychosis, or triggering psychosis, is one of the uh, things that research says is possible. So it doesn't happen in every situation, but it is possible. So the risks are quite high in that um, the government uh, is being uh, told to regulate the amount that people from 21, they're saying legalize at 21 and regulate the amount people can buy and the potency or the amount of THC in the grass that people at that age can smoke. We're just about to go to break, but when we come back, we'll continue the debate on the legalization of marijuana and continue talking about addictions and mental health. We'll be right back. Brought to you by Rogers Any Place TV. Enjoy exclusive content for free. Visit RogersAnyPlaceTV.com. Where did she come from? She's dressed black and white. She told me everything. She's gonna be alright. Maybe it's a moonlight or the moonshine. Number one for good times. Oh my God, this is my song. I've been listening to the radio. Oh Number one for favorites. She can hear those church bells ringing, ringing. And up in the loft at home. Number one for new music. Even when I'm about to Number one for country. Country 101. Only because he and Kim's not going to do it because he's busy too on my name's uh, Ricardo Menendez. I got into policing uh, because I wanted to try something new, something exciting. Do we still have him on the line to update us if whether or not it's still physical at this time? Gave it a, a, a chance. Guys, hey, listen, get over here. Started my career off with the RCMP out west. It just clicked at the end and I've been doing this career since 2009. I'm Paula Roy and I'd like to invite you to join me in my kitchen each week as I share with you my favorite recipes, hints, and tips.
Play four games of bingo from the comfort of your own home each Monday at 7 p.m. for your chance to win money from our $2,000 regular bingo or $5,000 super bingo night. Kiwanis TV Bingo, Mondays at 7 p.m. on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Auto Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour, and on tonight's show, we're talking about addictions, mental health, and suicide prevention. Peter, before we went to break, we were talking a little bit about uh, the legalization of marijuana and what that means for the changing landscape. Uh, Margaret, you had some comments to make about the role you think that it played in uh, your son's eventual suicide. Um, marijuana is something that's often trivialized and joked about, as is alcohol consumption. And I came across a stat that I found shocking that the World Health Organization uh, says that alcohol abuse is actually the third leading cause of death in the world and that just blew me away there is so much societal and corporate pressure on all of us to consume um, I mean not necessarily marijuana but certainly alcohol at functions we feel like we may not be eligible for promotions or advancements at work if we don't join the boss at a drinking party after work Peter what are your thoughts on that and you know what are the employers duty in, in, in creating a safe workplace for for employees mm. that's an interesting stat if, if I may that um, we're in the midst of an opioid crisis in 4,000 Canadians died last year from opioid overdoses. The number of people that have died from alcohol-related illnesses trumps it uh, fourfold. And, um, in Canada? In Canada. So 16,000. Um, I'm not exactly sure of the numbers, but it far surpasses. If it's the number th third leading cause of death, how yeah. many people died in obviously right so I don't have the numbers yeah. but I, I'm just saying that it seems like we talk about this opioid crisis but alcohol is far more accepted and, and to make your point it kills more people and we don't address it the same way and um, uh, our center deals with working people and um, so we don't really deal with youth um, we'll help them find a, a program that's best suited to meet their needs the needs of a working adult who's functional is very different than the needs of a youth who has an addiction. Yes. So we, we kind of specialize. Um, the In the workforce, substance abuse, or um, primarily, it depends on what workforce, but alcohol is part of the culture in many, many companies. And many and, countries, too. And many countries, yeah. So uh, some of the work we do with corporations is educate them, uh, help them write policies, uh, all of that, to, to, to um, try to change the culture. Uh, we had a case where, where a, a young man developed an addiction. Um, by the time he was in his 40s, he had been to treatment four times. The corporation was terminating. Um, it went to arbitration, and the arbitrator ruled that the company had been culpable in the development of the addiction because it was a uh, um, uh, workers out uh, their meetings were held in bars right. um, so if he was going to be a part of that workforce he had to go to the bar and drink with everybody else and they argued that to move ahead in that company you needed to be engaged and engulfed in that culture so drinking was a way to move ahead in advance in the company and if you didn't do it you wouldn't move ahead so um, a lot of the work we do with companies is to try to kind of separate them from uh, serving alcohol or promoting alcohol or having alcohol at events and it's a very difficult shift in in, uh, in the corporate culture. Mm -hmm. We have a caller on the line. Samantha, are you there? I am. Hi, Samantha. Did you have a question for our guests? I do. Um, in light of the fact that we're looking at the legalization of marijuana, uh, there's going to be a great difference in uh, stances that people are taking, whether they're pro or against. I personally am not supportive of the legalization of marijuana, and I'm just wondering if there is a good way for me to save face amongst uh, peers and friends in light of this. Margaret, what do you think? So the question is, what saving face? What do you mean by that? Saving face, Samantha? Uh, what did you mean by that? Uh, avoiding avoiding judgment, but still making my point uh, in regards to um, the fact that I'm not necessarily supportive. Not being a killjoy or being seen as a killjoy. Yeah, exactly. 
Uh, you know, that's a really great question. So, um, I'm, you know, I'm a recovering alcoholic, and, you know, a lot of people in AA, they, they're reluctant to, when they go to parties, they don't really know what to say. I'm really, really proud that I'm a sober person. And so when I go to parties, people ha I've noticed are quite good now. They're not really pushing it, but sometimes you meet these really pushy types who really want you to drink or party with them, and then I just say right away, I'm an alcoholic. I'll tell you, it does stop them, and they really say, oh, okay, would you like you know, a glass of juice or something? So the bottom line is I think that you should stand up for what you believe in. Um, Obviously, I've gone through a horrendous situation where I've seen what you know recreational marijuana use does, and you don't ever want to go through that. So you should just be proud of and stand up for it. And you don't have to be a killjoy, but at least you know you are entitled to your opinion. And you know I would take it. That's what I would do. What do you think? But I think that's some of what we're talking about, right? Is the societal pressure to conform to, to using or drinking, and now marijuana is become going to become part of that. And for young people, it's tough mm -hmm. in in a peer group to to be the the one who doesn't engage, and and so that pressure is there. And how do we shift mm -hmm. societal kind of view away from? away from that saying that you know it's really okay to take a stand and in, in, in to not use that not using is cool yeah. and, uh, and we're working on that I think with this talking that we're doing you know going on television discussing this I mean back in our day we didn't talk about mental health no. you know I was laughing with friends before you know in my in my family it was about discipline it wasn't about your mental health today we live in a very different world and you know Bell the whole talk uh, let's let's talk, let's talk yeah. has yeah. been very helpful so I think honestly Canada is really moving forward in a lot of a lot of ways and I want to make a quick point around marijuana the Trudeau government has wanted to push this from day one that's their policy promise now after even before my son died I'd been traveling around Ottawa to talk to the health officer to the police to different uh, groups in addiction and treatment and they've all said that they all went to Health Canada to discuss this and we're arguing that it shouldn't be any less than 25 years old and like a user should not be younger than 25? recreational use should be a minimum 25 and up and, why is that? and because of the whole developing brain issue so there's research there's science about that so I I just think that we in Canada we have never really had an opportunity to discuss us we've been told that this is a policy and there are a lot of people in this country that are against it for health reasons so I think it's critical that we do stand up and we start we need to at least educate so my goal is traveling across the country and I'm also speaking with teens and young people and explaining to them and so far some of the ones I've already talked to have said you know I didn't know anything about this I have anxiety I have OCD I have depression because of what you told me and I've watched your son's video I'm not going to do it yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much for calling in, Samantha. Uh, Peter, tell me a little bit about some of the, the solutions and techniques you work on at the Centre. So um, Newgate 180 is a one-year program where we have individuals living at a residence in Merrickville, right on their uh, beautiful scenic kind of location um, on the Rideau River. So it's pretty private? It is private. Um, we have two centers, one for men, one for women. We have um, primarily single gender programming, but we also have some co-ed programming. Um, and we have a holistic approach, so meditation, um, yoga, uh, we have a, a naturalist, we have a dietitian um, who meets, gives lectures and meets with clients, um, acupuncture. So we offer a wide variety of services to our clients. Um, and then there's counseling and therapy, um, group sessions. Um, so it's a very structured program for the 30 days that they're in residence. And then we have a one month, uh, I'm sorry, a one year, 11-month uh, ongoing care follow-up in that um, so you've is, pulled up some some of the pictures that you've sent oh, us at the okay. facility there yeah and the one month uh, the one year program involves a very active ongoing care so one of the things that um, I was talking about earlier is that often we believe that people want help they need to come to you and what we know about addiction is that when people start struggling they start pulling away from their resources and supports 
And so our belief is that when the agency should be more active, not less active, right? So as people start to slide, um, we develop a community of care and it's kind of like a safety net. And when people are in treatment, they agree to a process in which if they don't we have weekly follow-up where they call in because we deal with people across Canada. If they miss one call in one week, it's okay. If they miss two and we can't get a hold of them, we reach out to the safety net, which is people in their community, in the workforce, and at home. We involve the family and the workforce in the treatment from the beginning, and they become our allies. They, they need education and support but they also provide an ally in the ongoing care. If somebody starts to struggle, mm -hmm. we use them as a way to kind of reconnect with the individual and kind of get them on track before they kind of sway off. Now you focus on alcohol, drugs, and gambling? Correct, yeah. And what about sex addiction? No, well... Often we, they go hand in hand, right? Yeah, yeah, so we do so our counselors are, are, we have master's degree counselors, they provide, uh, we, ha we have, uh, um, but we have no certified sex therapists. Mm -hmm. So, but we do provide support and therapy and, and the normal kind of techniques that we would use with most mm -hmm. issues. Um, so we see, we see eating disorders and we see sex addiction mm -hmm. and, um, but we don't really treat it as much as we, we treat the whole person, yes. so in that sense we treat all of their uh, addiction. And are your services covered by OHIP, like what kinds of costs? No, we are a fee-for-service agency, we're a not-for-profit charity, yeah. so we're not fund, but we're not funded by the, by the government, so we're fee-for-service. And um, So a lot of insurance companies cover our cost, a lot of corporations and companies cover the cost for their employees, um, and we are geared for higher functioning individuals. Mm -hmm. um, so the cost for the year program is eleven thousand five hundred, and um, the uh, and we often say, you know, uh, we're there to help people. So if somebody calls us, whether it be a family member or a people person struggling, we offer support to the individual that calls. So if somebody's struggling with finding the appropriate resources um, or trying to figure out if they have an addiction, uh, they can call us and we'll, we'll work with them. Um, if they're appropriate for our services, then great. But if not, we'll work with them to get them to where they need to go because it's very difficult to navigate the, uh, the system. Mm -hmm. It's not user friendly and, and really when people want help, and they call and they get an answering machine or no one's there at the other end of the line. It's a terrible feeling. Yeah. It's a terrible feeling. Well, thank you so much for coming in to, to talk to us, Peter. We're at the end of our segment. But when we come back, we'll hear more about Margaret Meyer's story about how she healed herself using holistic therapies. And we'll be joined by registered social worker Olga Salgado Lacroix. We'll be right back. Uninterrupted coverage of speeches from Ottawa's business leaders, visionaries, and social figures. Watch new episodes of Podium at its new time, Tuesdays at 9.30 p.m., exclusively on Rogers TV. Bladder cancer. It's the fifth most common cancer in Canada. The most common symptom of bladder cancer is blood in the urine. Please. Don't ignore this warning sign. If you see red, see your doctor. For information and support, visit cred.ca. Looking for the best way to get the Major League Baseball games you want to watch? Rogers Super Sports Pack has you covered. With MLB Extra Innings, you'll have a premium ticket to over 2,000 out-of-market regular season games with most games available in HD. Don't miss the action from the games you want from both the American and National Leagues. MLB Extra Innings, part of the Super Sports Pack, the ultimate package for the hardcore sports fan. Order through your remote on Channel 431 today. you out into the community and you meet so many new people and experience so many new opportunities and builds my self-esteem and my confidence level. What I've learned here as a new volunteer 
is different skills that I thought I would never even be interested in learning. I'm Chantal McCush, and I am a Rogers TV volunteer. Hi, I'm Kathy Donovan, host of Refresh Your Passion, a speaker series for people who want to do more, be more, have more, and share themselves more in the world. Refresh Your Passion, only on Rogers TV. Welcome back to Ottawa Experts. I'm your host, Barbara Balfour, and we're back in the studio with addictions, mental health, and toxicity expert, Margaret Meyer, and we've also been joined just now by guest Olga Salgado-Lacroix. She is a registered social worker, yoga and meditation teacher, and the founder of Olga's Way. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Tell me a little bit about how you got into your line of work. So it's a long story, and it started uh, when I was 10 years old. I had a near-death experience, really? and I remember waking up from this coma thinking, I have to give back, you know, I have to help. So I initially thought I wanted to be a doctor, and that quickly changed when I saw blood. I was <laughs> like, maybe not. And so years later, I was 19 when I had to come to Canada as a refugee. Where did you come from? Colombia. And so very difficult circumstances, but thankfully my family is safe, and so was I. And I experienced a whole other uh, set of people helping me in this beautiful country. And so that feeling of wanting to give back just became bigger than, than myself. So I have been helping ever since. Yeah. And uh, the holistic aspect is a big, big part of your work. Yeah. So my first job as a social worker was actually in addictions, as an addictions uh, counselor. You know, I had been speaking English for four years and was trying to counseling, clinical counseling with uh, men in Ottawa. And I was seeing, it was a very uh, um, forward treatment center where they were already understanding the impact of trauma and why people end up drinking or abusing drugs due to child abuse or other types of trauma. But in my opinion, it was missing something. So I got really interested in learning more about mindfulness and yoga, and I had no idea that this research I was doing and this training I was doing to improve the life of my clients at the time was actually all for me because it changed my life and it became my biggest and largest passion. And I realized that school was amazing and gave me a lot of tools, but I really um, incorporated the holistic methods to help to marry them, you know, and, and have a much more fulfilling um, benefits for the people I was working with. And I want to hear more about those therapies and also sure. some of the therapies that you use, Margaret, to basically heal yourself. But first, we have a caller on the line. Julie, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi. Hi. Julie, thanks so much for joining us. Did you have a question for our guests? I do. Like, do you feel and do you think that, you know, with legalizing marijuana, the mental health issues will increase and there's going to be more in the mental health problems? Uh, personally, yes. I think, obviously, again, the developing brain issues. Um, we've got a lot, lot of young kids who are self-medicating. They have abusive environments or they're having issues mentally, and that's the first go-to. And I remember even my son saying, Mom, you watch in the next 10 years. Yeah, and you know, the sad thing is we don't even have resources today to help our mentally ill kids. My son, there was a one-year waiting list at the Royal Ottawa, and he had to actually leave the city to actually go and get additional help. And you know, when he died, he was still on the uh, waiting list for the pain clinic in London, Ontario. So yeah, the answer is absolutely yes. What do you think, Olga? I don't know if it's going to, the, I don't know that the, pro, the increase is gonna come from legalizing marijuana. I, I think of alcohol and the regulations that there are around alcohol and um, how difficult it is for minors to get a hand on buying alcohol or abusing it more than I don't even remember when it wasn't legal. Uh, I like, from my perspective, uh, the legalization is gonna bring forward more research coming from other parties, not just uh, the people who have been paid right now to the research pro or uh, against uh, marijuana. So we will have more information available and hopefully we will be doing a better job at educating minors um, who are going to be impacted the most when it comes to their mental health. 
as their brain is, is developing and they're using marijuana. So that's my hope that with the legalization, there's going to be more openness to doing research and having more information outside as we have with alcohol now or with nicotine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to make a quick question too. It's, you know, it's the whole difference between the THC right. as well as the yeah. CBD and there is a big difference. And we were just talking earlier yeah. that in the 70s, you know, it was about 3% THC. Well, now it's starting at 15, 20% and that is extremely high. So that's really an issue. So again, education is really critical and we definitely need to have more of a conversation. So I'm grateful that we're able to do that today. And reading labels, obviously. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Julie. Uh, Margaret, tell me a little bit about some of the, the therapies that you've used to, to heal yourself along the way. I know you've brought some props in for us. I don't know if you wanted to start with that or did you want to talk about detoxification yeah, first? Yeah, I would love to talk. So, um, you know, one of the things for me is we're seeing such an increase in mental illness these days. And, and I've been studying the impact of chemicals and environmental pollution. And uh, so one of the tests I do is a scientific hair and mineral tissue analysis. I've been doing it for over over 10 years and I'm working with a lab in the States and a doctor there and what we're finding is a lot of people with mental illness tend to have either surplus of copper or toxicity of copper so copper when it's too high creates a lot of emotional uh, disorders, mood, anxiety, panic attacks, OCD. So what's happening is we're seeing it in babies. So when babies have it, they're born either with jaundice if it's in their liver, but if it's in their brain, they end up having like ADHD and learning disorders. Then when young women begin to start their menstrual cycle, the copper goes up tremendously. So we're seeing now more 10 to 13 year olds being um, uh, put into hospitals in psychiatric care and we're actually seeing the underlying contributing factor is this copper. Where are they getting it from? So. Uh, the last 40 or 50 years we've been instituting a lot of copper pipes so that's a big issue but another issue is there's not enough zinc in our soil now and zinc and copper have an inverse relationship so as your copper gets jacked up and your mental illness symptoms also get jacked up the zinc goes down so we look at literally balancing the ratios so it's not about just going out and buying zinc the test actually shows you what the ratios are and then we work with nutritional supplementation to rebalance your minerals I also test for five toxic chemicals and in Ottawa I've been testing from six years old to 72 wow. and every single person has had at least lead mercury and aluminum in their bodies so this is more related often to memory you know you know I'm older and I don't want to have Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and I had some degree of aluminum in my body so I've been able to eliminate the lead and the mercury and now I'm looking at aluminum I do not want to get Alzheimer's when I'm older Who does? so exactly <laughs> yeah. so so that's a big issue and more women in their 60s now are really getting more Alzheimer's so uh, it's really critical then to protect your brain so number one you need to detox and I have a machine as you know you brought us some uh, some images of um, some of the things that come <laughs> out when you detoxify yourself let's pull this up on the screen now it's a it's an ionic foot bath right, right? so right. tell us about how it works so basically you put your feet in water and we put a little array plate in and it's electricity in the water creating charges and they actually go up your feet uh, your pores expand you have 2,000 pores on each foot and it expands and these charges go into your body and literally pull out biological waste now when you put your feet in the water the water is clear like I, I came over to your house the other day and I did and the water was clean and then it turned this terrible color right, and I right. was very disturbed <laughs> <laughs> I remember and you actually had a lot of these little black flecks which yeah. is toxic chemicals right. so a big part for me the missing piece I think in mental illness is the impact of why are we getting it like look let's look at the cause the cosmetics the, the everything chemicals. You, what you're putting on your body what you're drinking drinking water has a lot of uh, it has aluminum now it has arsenic it has antimony uh, uh, the foods you're eating uh, nutritional deficiencies our stress that all affects our mineral levels and ends up declining them so number one if you want a quick detox people just come in it's 20 minutes mm -hmm. fast I just had a 30 year old young guy come in today lots of heavy metals and I definitely have people now with mental illness that are coming in and I worked with a young woman very very young girl uh, with hyperactivity and just by detoxing her it actually calmed her down so I think it's really important if you have mental illness, find out what your mineral levels are and what toxic chemicals are and detox you. So the first picture that we saw earlier was somebody who actually had parasites. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So look at the root cause. We have a caller on the line. Uh, Marie, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, Marie. Thank you for calling in. Did you have a question for our guests? 
Yes, I do. My question is, I recently did a DNA test for, like, from Ancestry, the website Ancestry, but ironically, um, I put that through a medical process where you get a little bit more information from the medical side. Now, my question is, um, I, I discovered there's a lot of uh, high risk for mental illness in my DNA. And so my question would be, how much would you say is nature versus nurture in terms of, you know, your DNA versus uh, being at risk for mental illness versus maybe your environment, your upbringing, um, and any other external risk factors? Fascinating question. What do you think, Olga? I think that all of those elements you mentioned have everything to do with uh, your health, mental or physical, and is how you cope with your self-care. So I do think that uh, you said nurturing, nurturing yourself is fundamental to like doing things like detoxifying, the foods you're eating, uh, how are you coping with your regular stressors in life, what relationships are you in, how are you coping with the trauma you may have had as, as a child or as an adult. So taking self-care is, um, it's how you can cope with all of these obstacles you may have faced in our food, in um, the products that we're using, or the environmental, or your DNA. You know, we're all prone to having mm -hmm. multiple medical conditions. Not all of us develop them, even though we're prone to them. And I do believe, I strongly believe that how you go about living your life with nurturing and self-care can prevent you from developing some of these conditions. What are some of the things a, you do for yeah, self-care? That's, that's a really great question yeah. that what that person said because um, uh, what we're finding for example is mothers now are actually passing on toxic chemicals and mineral imbalances to an unborn baby. So if a mother has a lot of stress her, her copper actually goes up and she ends up indirectly passing that on in utero. Mm -hmm. So I think that's really important. So anybody who's struggling with mental illness should obviously be detoxing and cleaning out before they're pregnant, but also be aware of this. And uh, so genetics obviously is important as well. Uh, a friend of mine actually had done a DNA test and uh, her, I think she found her kids had more of a propensity for addiction. So like me, I was very concerned. I'm a al you know, recovering alcoholic. I sat down with my son a lot and talked about the impact you know, of alcohol to be careful because you know, I was concerned because I had obviously uh, become addicted um, and definitely just become more aware and do things, find out more what's going on internally. I think that too often we just, you know, people that have mental illness, they go to a doctor the doctor you know, pulls out their DSM statistical manual booklet, you fit into certain symptoms and then they give you a drug. And I really don't think that's just the best way. So you need to look at the biochemical aspects of it, then we look at the nutritional aspects, and like you said, the self-care, I'm starting to meditate myself. There's always things that we can all do to improve our health. We're just about to go to break, but I want to hear more about uh, your mindfulness meditation techniques, Olga, when we come back from the break. Sure. And the center that you're opening will be right back. Don't go away. Okay, we're supposed to be at City Hall. We're gonna build it right here. Ah, uh, yeah, sure. And give wetsuits to all the visitors? <laughs> no, on the water. Hey, come on, we're talking about building something the size of 64 city blocks. And there's no land left in Montreal. So, get serious. Listen! We'll build islands. How? Dig up Montreal? <laughs> <laughs> They're digging a subway, remember? You take it from there, and you put it here. 12 months and 25 million tons of fill later, St. Helens Island was reshaped and Ile Notre Dame was created. Come on, we don't want to keep Mayor Drapa waiting, do we? Montreal's Expo 67. It would prove to be the most successful World's Fair of the 20th century. Most people living with it don't even know they have it. I'm Alex Lifeson. My family, like many of yours, has dealt with the conditions that cause kidney disease. If you have diabetes, high blood pressure, or a family member with kidney disease, you are at risk. If you are overweight or over 50, you are at risk. 
and certain ethnic groups are also at higher risk. Please talk to your family doctor and have your kidney function checked regularly. Celebrate Ottawa is a collection of stories for, by, and about the people, places, and rich history that make Ottawa such a vibrant place to call home. Tune in Sunday evenings at 7.30. Hi, welcome back to Ottawa Experts. <laughs> I'm your host, Barbara Balfour. Before we went to break, Olga, you were telling me a little bit about the uh, holistic aspect of your work. Tell me a little bit about the beliefs that, uh, that govern your work, the work that you do with your clients, and especially your work with mindfulness and meditation. So my specialty is in stress-related conditions, and so anxiety and depression do come in quite often through my office. And something I'm really keen about is teaching people tools that they can take home. So, so we talked about uh, mental health and counseling not being something that everybody can afford yes. or that every health insurance covers. Sometimes it seems like mental illness and poverty go hand in hand. Sadly, yeah. yeah. In, in the sense that those who cannot afford it will go Suffer the most. Yeah, yeah. unnoticed. Yeah. So I like giving tools to people that they can actually used to what we call self-regulate. So if I'm having a lot of anxiety, I don't have um, a form of you know, attending counseling every week. I want to teach people tools that they can use on their own and it's twofold. So they can use these tools, but also that they believe in themselves having the ability to do that. So, so you have a couple techniques yeah, that you wanted to yeah. teach our viewers today. So I'll talk about two very quick mindfulness techniques. So. I have to first explain what mindfulness is. My definition of mindfulness is how in your mind and your body at the same place at the same time, in the same place at the same time. So where your body is is not often where your mind is, right? And that's when we run into trouble. Our mind goes into five years from now, what ifs, and or last year when this happened. And so the body's always in the present. So I have this one technique that I call the 333 technique. And so when you're in a moment of having a, a mind that's going too fast and you're not in the present, you notice you're not in the present, usually you're preoccupied, you feel your chest going faster, your breathing going faster, um, and or you feel panicky or not, you can't concentrate, I suggest you do this technique. And so we'll do it now if you guys okay. want. Let's okay. pretend that you're really stressed right now. Okay. Uh, <laughs> don't say them out loud right now, but think of three things that you can see from where you are. So three things you can see. Now, three things that you can hear. And three things that you can physically feel. Okay, so where was your mind, guys? Totally in the present. Yeah, how do you know? Because I had to think about where I was. I had to slow the racing of my mind mm -hmm. and focus. With and discipline. I don't do that often mm -hmm. enough. There you go. High five. Yeah. I've done my job. <laughs> I've done your job. So our senses are always in the present. So how to engage your mind to be in the present is by trying to notice what your senses are doing. Now that technique can be used in a moment of uh, high levels of stress or a mind that is going over, obsessing over the same thought maybe that is worrying you. I've been there multiple times, and so sometimes it takes you to do this same exercise more than once, and then eventually your mind gets the message, okay, we're back to the mm -hmm. present. So that's one okay. quick one. What's the second one? The second one is, I'm gonna guide a very short meditation, okay? So I'm gonna ask you guys to close your eyes. Okay. I'm beginning to notice your physical body. So maybe your hands on your lap or the chair underneath supporting you. And now bring your awareness onto your breath without manipulating the breath. So don't change the way you're breathing. Just notice that you're breathing. And bring awareness now to your mind. 
Allow the thoughts to come. Just notice them. Notice the quality of the thoughts. No judgment needed. And then return to your breath. And voila, you've meditated. Wow, on live television. Not on live television. <laughs> <laughs> we have a caller on the line. Ashley, are you still there with us? Hi, yeah, I'm here. Hi, Ashley. Thanks so much for calling. What was your question? Thanks. Um, I have a, a family member who isn't really into, like, new age kind of stuff. And uh, I wanted to relay your answers to them. So I guess I'm kind of asking on their behalf. But I was wondering um, what, like, scientific research says about, um, like, the correlation between the toxic chemicals in your brain in relation to mental illness and um, if the panelists knew any scientifically proven ways to like detoxify that. Great questions. What do you think, Margaret? So absolutely. So I mean, like I said earlier, we, you know, we test for lead, mercury, uh, aluminum, and they obviously impact the brain. And the biggest thing is that when you have toxic metals in your body, your body doesn't differentiate between a mineral and a toxic chemical. So it actually takes that toxic chemical and that impacts the whole biochemistry of your brain. So with regards to hair and mineral testing, uh, the uh, EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, actually did a whole 300 page study of um, over 400 hairy mineral tests and actually found it to be extremely effective in uh, determining toxicity and chemicals in the body. And just to give you a quick thing, remember Napoleon? Uh, Napoleon died in 1821, but it wasn't until a century later through hair and mineral uh, tissue analysis that they figured out he actually died of arsenic poisoning. Wow. Yeah. Now, you, you had a, a technique called EFT that you wanted to get into. Yeah, yeah. So I'm a certified pro EFT practitioner. I've been doing it for over 10 years now. Um, it's very effective for... It's called emotional freedom. Yeah, emotional freedom techniques, EFT. And uh, the American Veterans Association has actually recently amalgamated it into a scientific hol holistic modality for the American Veterans Association. So I work with police, first responders, I work with Afghani vets, I've also worked now with a lot of younger people. Uh, you can do it, uh, it's great for anxiety, uh, depression, OCD. And it's scientifically proven, it's isn't it? It's scientifically proven and not only do I teach you the technique, but then you can actually do it on yourself when you start to get, you know, a little revved up. So it's very, very effective. So and what do you do? It's basically uh, based on tapping. It sounds really bizarre, but it's based on the kind of Chinese medicine of the acupressure points. Yeah. And what it does is it kind of opens up a window into the subconscious, which allows you to say, for example, you know, you don't want to stop drinking or you want to make a change, but there's a part of you that's very re resistant, whether it's quitting smoking or getting help for depression, there's always this resistance. So we deal with the resistance first. So we say things like, I don't want to change because a part of you does not want to change. And and then over time, the tapping calms down the kind of the emotional charge around it. And then you say, well, you know what? I think I might be open to wanting to change. And then eventually you get into I choose to change. And then you choose the new belief system. But it's been very effective for trauma. Uh, I work with individuals who've been raped, uh, you know, individuals in abusive relationships. And so even people that are depressed like if you've been depressed for a very long time you've become exceptionally negative so before we, I even get into depression we actually look at changing the mindset becoming more positive being more respectful of your body you know talking about self-care learning how to love yourself you know addicts don't love themselves yeah. and the addict is a very strong component in that subconscious that only wants you to drink to the point of dying mm -hmm. and so we have to go back and just deal with that more positive. I'm working with a young woman right now and she's just been amazing in, in, in her recovery and her change and taking care of herself and meditating and we're just starting with that and then eventually she'll end up going into AA. But see some people, especially young people, if they think that they can never drink for the rest of their life, they don't want to go into AA. So then we have to do it in a more circular fashion. But now she feels so much better about herself mm -hmm. and that self-love is so critical mm -hmm. to self-care. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thanks so much for calling in, Ashley. Now, Olga, you run a meditation center in Orleans and you've got big plans for expansion after the summer. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So Olga's Way was born, uh, actually born two years ago, where I left my full-time job of being told how to help people <laughs> to actually doing it the way I thought would be more beneficial. And to tell you the truth, I was really hoping that 
people had an interest in meditation. And to my surprise, uh, there has been a lot of uh, demand for, for the meditation classes, for instance, or that aspect of my counseling sessions is uh, a lot of people who are coming to see me say that's the reason they selected me over other uh, therapists in Ottawa. It's which because there's of your meditation. So many, yeah, because that incorporation of meditation. So what I realized is that a lot of people need quiet. Uh, we had a brief conversation and you said something to me that most people say to me when they hear what I say, what I do, which is, no, 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 I could never meditate. My mind is always going uh, I'm thinking fast. about laundry or... <laughs> and that's yeah. exactly, you're the perfect person to <laughs> meditate. Yeah. And I tell you because that's me. Yeah. <laughs> you know, my mind is always thinking, it's always on to what's next. I have a crazy amount of fire inside of me that has allowed me to so many things and continue to have so many interests. But I've also learned that I have an incredible power to discipline my mind. And when you do that, you find you find home. You find a place within you where you can tap into your own power. And, and nothing can give you that other than yourself. So these meditation classes that you'll be offering, are they specifically targeted towards uh, people struggling with addiction or mental, mental health mm, issues? They're open to everybody. Okay. So uh, in an ideal world, and I do spend my time thinking what an ideal world will look like, everybody meditates. I think that this world will be so much better. Uh, we will have so much more compassion. The parts of your brain that get uh, uh, exercise by meditating is compassion yeah and so imagine if we could all have that that part of our brain that muscle of our brain being really uh, strong how how much compassion will we feel how much we will see ourselves in everybody's mm -hmm. story mm -hmm. and 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 that self-love to be able to cope with whatever it is that you're going through life being has to come to from yourself. you you know yeah. life is so tough as it is already for for all of us that you being your enemy does not serve you or anybody around you. So my goal is to make people find, find falling in love with themselves, being their own ally. And so these classes will be, uh, once we open uh, the larger center, I want to have classes from 6 in the morning till 8 o'clock at night, uh, different times so that people who are really busy can say, okay, I'm going to stop in for 15 minutes and and get my meditation on, kind of like what we do with a gym, you know, exercising our brain. Mm -hmm. And you have some free resources available on your website Absolutely. as well, yeah. so daily meditation exercises. Yeah, they, like I, I, have, um, I have a podcast that, that is free where Fantastic. I tell uh, uh, inspirational stories from people who have overcome incredible stories. Uh, I also have free meditations that are recorded, so it's my voice that some people find relaxing <laughs> up, uh, as well for free. And we have one that is mindfulness for every day. And so that's an online class that's all for free. That's wonderful. Thank website. you so much, Olga. Margaret, we only have a few seconds <laughs> left until the end of our show. Very quickly, how can we find you? And you're giving away a, a health consult, so how can people throw their name in the hat for that? Yeah, so basically just go on my website, naturallyu.info. It's actually a, a health consult and a detox. And I really want to encourage you, if you're struggling with depression or anxiety, there's hope. There are other things that you can do. There are scientific, holistic modalities. And please give me a call anytime. Thank you so so much ladies for your expertise you. we'll be back next week see you in the studio you take care deal with all this stuff.